All right. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to the Hangout. Um, thank you very much. We are going to connect several classrooms for land to the research Val excuse me, to the research vessel Falcor at sea. My name is Logan Mockbunning, and I'm a communications on the communications team for Schmidt Ocean Institute. A big thanks to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for getting us all together. We're excited to have classrooms from all over North America joining us as we talk about science and research, as well as living and working on research vessel Falkor during a mapping expedition. Um, we're going to be map. We excuse me. The last half was mapping. This part is going to be about studying corals. We're um, gathering samples and uh, video footage. Um, I want to welcome everyone again. Um, Ocean View Junior High School, Coolidge Elementary School, Grove Public School, Amherst View, and Taylor View, Taylor View Junior High. To get things rolling, a little bit of background about the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Uh, we were established in 2009 and strive to advance the frontiers of ocean research and exploration through technological innovation, operational support, and open sharing of information. Our ship, the research vessel Falcor, is off the coast of the island of Lanai in Hawaii using robotics to observe and gather coral in order to understand past cycles of sea level changes. With this information, they hope to be able to predict how sea levels may change in the future. Um, I, I would like to now pass it over to one of the scientists aboard the ship, Dr. Ken Rubin. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Ken. Um, we don't stand on ceremony in, uh, in the earth sciences, which is the discipline that I work in. Uh, we all call each other by our first names. And yeah, we're out here on the research vessel Falcor. We've been studying the seafloor, uh, going to places that some of which no one has ever seen before. It's always exciting to be among the first people that see a piece of seafloor for the first time. There's always surprises beneath the sea. And part of our uh, mission here is to help understand sea level change. Uh, I'm sure uh, many of you are aware that the ocean level goes up and down. That's the volume of the oceans changing over time. And the reason they change is because the planet gets warmer and cooler and warmer and cooler. There are natural cycles that drive that. And added to those natural cycles are human activities, things that uh, have been happening since the Industrial Revolution. That may be a term that you've already learned about in a history class. Maybe you haven't heard about that yet. But when uh, humankind started really using machinery and we started using powered machinery and we started burning things like gasoline and coal, we started emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide warms the atmosphere and it causes global warming. So one of the things that we're interested in understanding is when the sea level uh, changes, and it changes because we're melting ice on the continents, how does it change? And for about the last decade, we've known that uh, sea level doesn't change the same everywhere. There's a whole bunch of different reasons why uh, it isn't like adding water into a bathtub. And each place, each location on the planet experiences effects that cause sea level to rise more slowly or more quickly. And we're participating in a concerted effort with a bunch of other scientists at other universities and other government agencies around the world to try and understand the differences from place to place and what drives that difference and to make a computer model which will help us predict future sea level change. So what um, my team, we decided to do was pick the last time in Earth's history where we know sea level changed a lot. And that was during the last Ice Age. I know Ice Age is a couple of their popular movies called Ice Age and their cartoons and everything else. And there's dinosaurs walking around. Uh, the real Ice Age, the one that uh, the Earth experienced about 20,000 years ago, there were no dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were long gone. There were cavemen. There were other uh, animals living on the land, but in the oceans, especially in places like Hawaii, it was pretty similar to today. So ice ages don't mean that the whole planet gets icy and cold. It just means it gets icy and cold in some places. So we have the benefit of being able to look at a kind of material, coral, coral that grows in a coral reef in the past at a time when sea level was changing, 
and see how sea level affects those corals and then use that to help us make predictions about the future. So we're interested in a couple of different things. One thing we want to know is basically how fast was sea level changing in Hawaii during the period of time between 20,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago. During that time, sea level changed by almost 500 feet. It's a huge amount. Large parts of what had been land became flooded and um, other parts of the world, the amount of sea level change was a little bit less. So we're interested in studying the amount of change in Hawaii and comparing it to some other places and helping to develop these models that will give us better prediction power for the future. I know some, some of the class, I heard there was a classroom here from uh, Southern California, from Oxnard. You want to know, uh, or the people who are helping to plan for the future in your city, they want to know how much sea level is going to change there in the next hundred years. Someone who's living in Florida or Maine or New York or Hawaii or Japan or anywhere else that's coastal, they also want to know how much sea level is going to change in their place. And so we need to develop what's called a global model. And that's part of what our work is doing. Now, another thing we're really interested in is how does changing sea level affect what lives on a coral reef? So it turns out that when you go, I don't know if any of you have ever gone snorkeling before or you've seen on TV people scuba diving on a coral reef. They're very diverse ecosystems. And that's a fancy way of saying that there are a lot of different kinds of organisms that live in that environment. So we, when we go around the world, um, like I like to do, that's why I picked this job for my career, you get a lot, lot to travel a lot, and you snorkel or you scuba dive, you see different corals living in different places. That has to do with the geography of coral distribution, it has to do with the environment, how hot the water is, it has to do with how many nutrients are in the water, it has to do with um, are you in a place with a lot of waves or a little wave, action, a whole bunch of different things control what corals we see in different environments on different reefs. And it turns out that when sea level changes, it also changes the environment. Some corals can grow really quickly, and so they don't mind if sea level changes relatively quickly, they just grow faster and taller. Some corals, they don't like uh, fast sea level change, so they die out. And so one of our goals here is to reconstruct time through this coral reefs that we're studying. And we do that by taking samples of coral and taking them back to the lab and determining how old they are. Um, and then we look at what corals were growing on the reef over time. And if they change, we can then help make predictions about how to enhance the resilience of the current coral reefs around the world to make sure that 100 years from now, 200 years from now, as sea level continues to rise, we'll still have healthy reefs. They may not all have the same species of coral. There may be different varieties growing there, but we want to make sure that we have some species that can survive the rising temperatures and the rising sea levels. So Real quick, Ken. our expedition, oh yeah, sure. You mentioned uh, the examples you've been given. Uh, you were talking about snorkeling and scuba diving, but in this expedition, we don't actually have people in the water. We have some robots. So could you talk a little bit about the robots and how they're used? Yes, sure, Logan. So um, what we're doing here on um, RV Falcor, the research vessel Falcor, is using a submarine robot. It's called Sebastian. Sebastian is controlled by a whole team of pilots. It gets put overboard and it's connected to the ship by a cable and it can dive down to very deep depths in the ocean, places where humans couldn't go because the weight of the water that's a, that when you're diving deep is so intense that a person would be crushed. But they make these vehicles out of very strong metals and um, other strong materials. And then uh, pilots sit in a control room and they drive it around. We happen to be using the ROV, remotely operated vehicle, Sebastian, in really shallow water. It's only between 100 and 200 meters, which um, you can always multiply by three. It's actually 3.3, .3, but roughly to get how much that is in feet. So I'll let you all quickly do that calculation for yourself. And I'll tell you what that is in feet uh, in a moment. But that's really shallow for this vehicle. This vehicle can operate as much as a mile down uh, under, under the water. And uh, so the scientists and the pilots are safely sitting up on the ship. 
the vehicle is able to take pictures. It's the pilots are able to control it. They have a series of thrusters uh, that, you know, when you're in the control room, it almost looks like they're playing a video game, except they have a multi-million dollar piece of equipment connected to a wire that they're driving around, trying not to crash into things and trying to do the delicate maneuver of taking samples. And the taking of samples involves at least two people, but sometimes three people. One person is driving the vehicle, and we never leave the vehicle just sitting there. It uh, usually has its thrusters on so it can stay stable. It's being connected to the ship, so we've got someone driving the ship. And then we have someone running the manipulator. And the manipulator is a metal claw that uh, comes out, and it can be expertly driven to pick up really delicate pieces of sample. And those samples can be living organisms, they can be pieces of rock, we have scooping devices, we have sucking devices, so pretty much any anything we see on the seafloor that we want to take, we can if it doesn't weigh too much. The remotely operated vehicle does have a weight limit. We can't put on, we can put on about 400 pounds of stuff. And when you're picking up rocks, it yeah. starts to add up pretty quickly. Yeah, so uh, Sebastian is a really uh, fascinating uh, vehicle, and it's, uh, it's very agile, and the team of uh, engineers and pilots who control that system are always innovating, and one of the things that we're using out on this expedition for the first time is what's called a photo mosaic sled, and that's a fancy way of saying it's an attachment with a couple of cameras that go on the bottom and these cameras take images in stereoscopic view so that we can use the cameras the two images together with our understanding of the altitude of the vehicle above the seafloor to reconstruct the 3D structure of all the stuff we see on the seafloor. And so a couple of dives ago we used the vehicle for the first time in this configuration. It, it didn't work perfectly but we learned a lot about how, how to improve it for next time. And that's, that's how it works when you're using brand new technology. It never works exactly right the first time, but um, through trial and error, we'll get that thing working um, and we'll be able to look at the sizes and shapes of things that are smaller than about a half an inch. So that's a pretty exciting innovation that the vehicle uh, is doing on this expedition. Um, some of you may have heard of other kinds, so we call it a ROV for remotely operated vehicle. That means the pilots are remotely operating it from on the ship. There's something else called an HOV, that's a human operated vehicle. You may have heard of the, for instance, the submarine Alvin. That's another kind of deep submergence vehicle. Um, we're not using that on, on this expedition. And there are various trade-offs. The HOVs are a little bit more maneuverable. But one of the benefits of having an ROV is that we can have many more scientists and many more people from the public engaged in the activities. So people are able to watch the video as we're doing our work on the seafloor. You can see it on YouTube, you can see it on Facebook Live, and that's something that doesn't happen when we're down there in a submarine, a human-occupied vehicle. We're isolated from the ship for, you know, 10, 12 hours at a time. So this is another sort of innovation that allows us to engage more scientists. If, if we happen to see something very cool on the seafloor that none of us recognize, we can just send an email to one of our friends or colleagues back at some, any university in the world and say, hey, quick, tune in. What is that thing? And they can tell us what that thing is. So it's, um, it's a really exciting way to do science. Great. Thank you very much. Um, with the uh, the expedition and it's the way it's going so far, I know that you have been both recording video of different coral and different ge um, geological settings, as well as occasionally taking um, some samples. What sorts of discoveries or or, or um, results are you looking for to find while you're on the ship? So part part of this um, expedition involves going back to places that we've been before and studying them in more detail and trying to get a detailed understanding, for instance, of 
the types of and numbers of corals that grew in this setting 10,000, 15,000, and 20,000 years ago. Another part of this expedition is exploration, trying to find other sites that uh, may be the same or may be different. It gives us a bigger picture of the sorts of variations one sees on coral reefs during that period of time. And um, when the samples come up on the ship, they're not always what we thought they were going to be. Um, we uh, bring them up um, when, when you're you know, reviewing them remotely. There's a several uh, considerations such as can the vehicle get close enough to sample them. Sometimes we're working in close quarters and uh, the grabbers can't get in to grab them. Um, are they very heavy? Are they strongly connected to the seabed? Um, these are these are some of the limitations. So you know, there's always a discussion in the uh, control room for the vehicle where we sort of explain to the pilots, you know, I'm looking for something about this big and this thick, and it's got to have this particular shape. And then we sort of scan around on the seabed, and you know, we find something that looks similar, and we we try to pick it up. We bring those things back up to the ship, and there's a team of scientists here that are investigating those samples. Um, they get cut open with a rock saw and we look to see if there's coral in there and what the structure of the coral is. We can identify the, um, the genus and the species of the coral in some cases just by the structure of the skeleton. You know, these corals, they were living 10 to 20,000 years ago. They're not alive anymore, so we call them skeletal corals. It's a skeleton uh, of that uh, organism. And one of, the, one of the sort of exciting things that we're about to embark on today is going to a brand new site, a place we haven't studied before. It's about a thousand miles to the south of Hawaii. It's called Palmyra Island. There's another island nearby called Kingman Reef. It's, it's barely an island. It, it, it only sticks about a foot above sea level at low tide. Um, and the reason we picked this site is by having another location that's not too far away from Hawaii, but it's a different site. Um, we'll be able to compare the difference, Ho hopefully if we find the same kinds of coral reefs there that we see in Hawaii, we'll be able to compare the difference in how they responded to sea level change, the magnitude of sea level change, and, and be able to uh, better inform our model predictions for the future about sea level change in the Pacific Ocean because of that geographic uh, separation. Great. Uh, you've mentioned that so you work... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say uh, that um, I hope everyone's had their time to do their calculations. Uh, 100 meters is about 330 feet, and 200 meters is about 660 feet, and that's the depth range that we're working on in this expedition with uh, the ROV Sebastian. Thank you very much. I had forgotten about the puzzle earlier. Um, you've mentioned that you, you travel a lot and that you, uh, you work on the, sorry, gonna mute you real quick, there we go, um, that you work on ship and on land in a lab. Um, what's it like working on a ship? So working on a ship is, it's a lot of fun, and it's, um, it's a bit like having a home on a floating platform where um, the place that you eat, the place that you sleep, and the place that you work are all really close together. And you have uh, 20 or 30 of your friends with you all the time. So uh, life on a ship, um, it's very comfortable. They, uh, the Schmidt Ocean Institute works very hard to make sure that uh, we're all healthy and happy and productive. And you do a lot of walking up and down, up and down stairs, which on a ship they call ladders. Um, so, you know, there's many different levels. We have, we, there's a, a level where most of the people are sleeping. There's a level where we eat. There's um, the level where the vehicle, the remotely operated vehicle is launched from. And uh, we move about to these places. When you first get on the ship and you've never been on it before, everything's very confusing. You spend a lot of time trying to figure out what door goes to what thing. And, you know, and after about a day, you realize everything's pretty close together. Uh, and it's not too hard. You know, it's uh, unlike um, when you're working at home, um, you know, you got to get up and get into traffic and drive to work and you get there sometime later. Here I can just get out of bed, take a shower, and I can be at work in literally one minute. So um, it's, it's interesting. The ship has all the same um, facilities that we would have 
uh, in a laboratory. So we have, um, you know, fume hood for chemicals. We have, um, we can set up in anything we want in the labs. Uh, there's computers on the ship. We have internet access. Um, there are TVs where people can watch uh, video. So the sort of combination of things that a person would normally do, uh, there are people who do exercise on the ship. There's a gym on the ship. All that stuff is here and available so that um, we can conduct our research. Pretty much the only things we don't have out at sea are the sort of, you know, very sensitive electronic equipment, the mass spectrometers, um, and the associated uh, clean laboratory that um, we use to process the samples that we're collecting on this expedition. Take, when we take them back to the lab to determine how old they are, that that's something you couldn't do from sea. It's, it's just not stable enough on a ship. Uh, ship's always moving around. That's sort of one other difference, I guess. Um, than uh, if you were on land. But otherwise, we're sitting in a library right now, and if it weren't for the fact that a window were open and the floor's moving a little bit, I would feel like I was uh, at home, you know, or some other place on land. It's almost the same these days. That's great. Um, Mr. Richards, it looked like maybe one of somebody in your classroom had a question. Yep, he's, he's just gonna come up for you. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if you could show us around the ship, if it's possible. I'm afraid that's not possible right now. Uh, on the screens behind Ken, you can see some of the the uh, feeds of the televisions around the ship. Um, I'm afraid right now they're actually uh, in motion going to, like Ken said, a remote area and we don't quite have enough internet to walk around the ship. Um, Ken, uh, do you want to describe a little bit about how what the bridge looks like and about what the control room looks like, uh, uh, just to sort of give a little bit of visuals? Thank you for that question. Sure. So, yeah, it's a great question. And the the bridge, which is where uh, the captain and the officers drive the ship from, it's high up on the ship, so they have a good view of everything. And it's a big room with glass all the way around and a huge number of control panels with switches. If any of you have ever been on an airplane and you look in and then you see the cockpit and there's all sorts of switches and knobs, this is just like that. Uh, except there isn't anything on the ceiling, but all around you, there's all sorts of different control systems, and there's several people up there that are monitoring different things um, about the ship, how fast the engines are running, are they overheating, what position are we going, um, is there other traffic out there, and so that's, that's what the bridge looks like. The control room, um, where we run the remotely operated vehicle from, um, it, it looks like high-tech heaven. There's about 30 uh, TV screens and computer monitors. There's a bunch of uh, gaming chairs that look very comfortable. And uh, then there's all the various kinds of controls sitting up on a series of benches in front of where the pilots and the scientists sit. You know, they don't really let the scientists touch anything, um, you know, driving the vehicle because we would probably crash it. We get to run the cameras. Um, and so each person has sort of a joystick or a computer or something in front of them and everyone's got a job. And we're um, either, you know, directing the dive or we are following what's going on. We're recording all of the, the particulars. There's one person who's just um, looking at photographs that come up every second along the wire and they're describing what they see. There's another person who's taking notes about, um, you know, the samples that we're taking. And of course, all the pilots are monitoring a ton of things. They're not just looking at what where we're driving or what we're picking up. They're looking at pressures and temperatures and the signals coming off of uh, a large number of electrical systems to make sure they're all operating correctly. We're currently in, a, in the, what they call the library, which is a big room with, it's got sofas all the way around and a couple of large tables and some uh, TV monitors. We have a lot of meetings in this room. Uh, at night, you'll come in and see people watching movies or whatever. Uh, there's the galley. That's the place that we all eat. It looks kind of like a small restaurant. There's a buffet, um, you know, several times a day and a bunch of tables. And uh, everyone goes down there, gets their food, eats their meal, and then uh, you have to wash your own plate at the end, and you put it into a into a bin called the sculler. It's in the scullery. Um, 
And yeah, there's uh, there's a series. There's a, a really nice space on the ship called the observation deck. It's high up on the ship. It's got uh, nice wood floors and it's got a really cool canopy. There's a hammock up there. There's some really nice deck chairs. And so when you need a little bit of downtime, you can go up there and you know check it out. While we've been close to the islands here in Hawaii, it's sort of the only place on the ship where you can get cell phone coverage. So if you want to call home or send a text message or uh, do that kind of thing, you go up onto the observation deck and have a beautiful view and have a conversation with someone. No problem. Great. Um, are there any other questions? Ms. Weiler, do you have any questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, what about Pam? It looks like Pam, you had a question. nervous about this. I'm afraid we're not hearing you very well. Is there maybe a way that you could type the question? Well, we can. Uh, this is Abby. I think her question was about um, she wants to go into like marine biology research at sea, and she wanted to know do you to become a scientist and. How much do these guys get paid to do what they do in the map? Uh -huh. Let me ask Ken. Ken, did you hear that? Um, I, I heard parts of it. Could you repeat the question? It was, uh, how would yeah. you become a, a marine biologist or someone who's working in the marine sciences? And then on top of that, uh, how do you find jobs and how much do you generally get paid? <laughs> okay. So... How you become a scientist, it starts right now when, um, when you're in school. Um, scientists need to um, sort of have three things. They need to be um, very knowledgeable about math and chemistry and biology and all, physics, all the disciplines of science. So when you're sitting through those classes and sometimes you're thinking, oh, this is sort of boring and I want to be home playing video games. Um, it's very important to, to do your work at school because it, every year you learn a little bit more. And, you know, I can't even tell you how many years uh, I went to school. I've lost track. Um, so, it's, so that's important. Another thing that's important is to be curious. Um, scientists uh, retain the curiosity that most people have when they're young. So you're lucky. Mo most people who are your uh, age that you guys are um, have a natural level of curiosity that a lot of adults lose. They go through the world just sort of, you know, drudgerily um, thinking about their bills or whatever it is that they have going on. Whereas most scientists, especially the successful ones, we're always thinking about brand new things. I look at a map of the world or a map of the oceans, and the first thing I think is, what is there? What is under there? I, I got to check that place out. I got to see, especially if no one else has been there before. And whether it's in biology or geology or any discipline, that, that sense of discovery of wanting to ask questions and learn something new that someone else before you didn't know, it's really exciting. So that's, that's another aspect. And then, um, and then it's, it's a, sort of a matter of um, picking things that you do in your life that are going to lead you to the path of success. So, for instance, um, when I was in high school, I worked in a medical lab because I thought I wanted to be a biologist. And so I wanted to start learning about, do I like being in that kind of setting? Um, am I going to get grossed out when I see bloody parts? All those kinds of things are, are useful to do. And, um, and then you go to college, of course. Got to have a college degree to be a scientist, a special marine scientist. And usually you need what's called an advanced degree. So after you get your college degree, you go to graduate school. And in graduate school, you start to conduct independent research with an advisor. And that's where you really learn how you're, not, no, you're no longer just learning from a book. You're making discoveries. And once you've made several discoveries and you can convince other people at that university that your discoveries are significant, then they give you a degree. Um, you're called a doctor or a PhD. And then you can apply for a job that allows you to lead um, research expeditions. However, even um, if, you, if you choose to not be in that role, but you want to um, still be conducting science as part of a science team, there are sometimes opportunities um, with a bachelor's degree um, or a master's degree, it's somewhere in between the two. And, um, you know, it's, there are lots of good programs around the country. Um, 
pretty much any coastal state, any state that's on uh, the east or west coast or Hawaii, of course, have good marine research programs. A couple of other states that aren't um, on the coast also have good marine programs. So you kind of want to pick pick a university that um, specializes in the oceans. Uh, so that's kind of important as well. And um, yeah, I guess that's that's sort of how you, how you quote unquote become a scientist. But really, the most important thing is wanting to do the work of science. Uh, s some disciplines um, that people work when they grow up, they they go they sit in an office and they um, or whatever it is that they do. Um, it's really important to enjoy it. And so, if you enjoy, like like in my case, and I think. Um, a lot of the people on the ship, we like being out and about in the world. We like um, doing activities that, um, you know, maybe a little bit more uh, physical, um, not always in the same place at the same time. It's, it's just more interesting, but it also presents some challenges. And that's uh, especially the life of a, of a marine biologist or of a marine scientist. You have to be sort of flexible about working environments um, and um, enjoy going around from, you know, to different places. So how much do um, scientists make? We don't make, you know, the kind of money that like a rock star or a, uh, you know, football player or anything like that make. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're not starving. It's good. It's good money, um, you know, um, and it depends a lot on where you live and um, whether you work at a university or you work at a company. So it's it's a huge range, but it's usually uh, in what we call the six figures, meaning you know more than $100,000 a year, if that number means anything to you guys. I don't know. Um, was Is there another part of the question I'm forgetting? I think you're doing good, and we've got some other questions. So thank you for answering that okay. one. Uh, Ms. Whaler, yep. a, I think you guys had a question. Can you unmute, or do you want to type it? Oh, you're unmuted. All right, go ahead. Here we go. Um, okay, um, so what kind of wildlife have you seen in the, uh, on your expedition to Hawaii, coral, whatever? <laughs> yes. um, did you say what, what, kind, what kind of rocks we're seeing? What kind of coral? What, no, like what kind what of kind wildlife? Of like, not rocks, like, uh, oh, yeah. A wildlife. Oh, yeah, it's, there's a lot. So yesterday, for instance, we had a dive in a new place that we had never been before. And, you know, we wanted to try and find another site. And so we used a sonar system on the ship to try and find some uh, bits of rock on the seafloor. And we dove on them, and it was incredible. I mean, uh, as soon as the cameras came up on it, every color that you could imagine, um, there's uh, coral, there are fish, there are anemones, there are sponges, there's lobsters, eels. Um, there are lots in the, in the conditions we're working, and I'm going to throw a fancy term at you, it's called mesophotic. That just means a little bit of light. Some people call it the twilight zone. So we're deep enough in the ocean where very little light penetrates, but there's still a little bit of light. So we get some marine plants. Um, these are plants that are adapted to live in environments with just a very small amount of light. And so they usually have very uh, vivid colors, and those colors um, relate to pigments that the, those various organisms have that help them collect the small amount of light and convert it to energy uh, by a similar pathway to what you would see in a land plant. And so when we get to one of these places that are very densely populated with organisms living on the rocks, we tend to see lots of other things associated with it, especially uh, fish um, and yeah, so it's, um, you know, we, we had periods of time yesterday during our dive where um, we were sitting in one place making observations. We could count as many as 10 different varieties of fish and probably another 20 varieties of coral, deep sea coral living on the rock um, and other, other plants as well. So it's really diverse. It's not the same in each place. Um, some places are more barren than other places. A lot of that depends on things like um, are there really strong currents in the area or not? Um, is the water really clear or are there some sediments there? Um, when you're close to land in a place that's populated, we always have to worry about runoff. And one of the nice things about working uh, in the Hawaiian Islands where we've been is there's very little trash on the seafloor. Some, some environments I've worked in, you see a lot of the, the fancy term for it is marine debris, but it's really just trash. Anything from Coke cans to, uh, you know, toilets. You see all sorts of stuff on the seafloor. Um, but, but here in Hawaii, it's pretty good. And um, yesterday, we only saw one piece of trash. 
um, it was it was actually kind of a cool piece of trash. It was a huge anchor. It was about this big. And it was all rusty. And so at the end of the dive, we had a little bit of uh, capacity left on the vehicle to pull up some more stuff. So the pilots were all asking, oh, can, can we take that thing, you know? Um, and part of it is they wanted to clean up the seafloor, which is always a nice gesture. The other part is they wanted to have a cool old rusty anchor for their clubhouse. And so we said, yes, of course, uh, pick up that anchor. And they did. And um, it also had stuff living on it. So it, it's one of the interesting equalizers when you're on the seafloor. Anything that's hard, they don't, a lot of things don't like to live on soft sand. But when, if you have something hard, whether it's a rock um, or a piece of marine debris like an anchor, you find we had anemones living on it. We had uh, corals or a limpet living on it. So uh, you see a big variety. Great. Thank you, Ken. Um, I know that uh, you talk about the animals that we see in from the robot underneath the water. When I was on the ship last week, we also saw on the ship looking down at the ocean, we saw dolphins, we saw a manta ray, and we saw a shark. So we, like Ken mentioned earlier, there's lots of different levels of life in the ocean and, uh, and you see different animals living in there. So we've got about 10 minutes left and we're gonna try to get two more questions in. Uh, I believe, um, let's see, who is next? I apologize. I believe uh, Pam's class was next. No, excuse me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Roy has a question, and uh, if Pam has a question after that, that would be great. So, Mr. Bartnick. Yes. Oh, you're live. Uh, My question is: If you get like, is it scary in the night, like from the sharks, and not up? Yeah. So I heard, is it scary? <laughs> when you're working with the various robots that deep? Is that what I understand? Is it scary at night with the octopuses and sharks when you're down in the water? Ah. Ken, do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. So, um, no, it's not scary. Um, you know, uh, in, in most uh, environments where, you know, people do encounter other organisms, those organisms are probably more scared of us than, than we might be of them. On this particular ship, we aren't going in the water. The um, robot is going in the water, and I don't think the robot is scared of anything. Uh, but, you know, um, it is different on the ship at night. Uh, you go out, and the lights are out, and you, you realize how small you are. You're on a tiny ship in a big ocean. The sky is amazing. You can see stars in every direction. Um, and I, I wouldn't call it scary, but it's sort of an awesome feeling where um, – you you get a better perspective on you know how uh, how big big the world is and how many things there are out around you that uh, we still don't uh, know about. But um, yeah, I don't think we've had any at least that I know of no, no scary encounters on uh, this expedition. Great. And now I believe Mr. Whiff, did you guys have uh, a question? Yeah, we have one more question about coral. Um, Perfect. I wanted to know like what your thoughts. Are. Coral bleaching is. Did you hear that, Ken? Thoughts yeah, about so coral bleaching. I okay. did hear that. Yeah, it's a great question. So coral bleaching is, you know, uh, some of you listening may or may not be aware that a coral, a shallow water coral, is really um, two organisms living together in symbiosis. That's a, a term that means when you have two organisms that um, provide some aspect of um, I'm trying to think of a way of saying this, um, uh, th their metabolism that allows the two organisms to coexist. One, each organism provides something that the other organism uses. And coral bleaching is basically the loss of what we call the algal symbiont, which again is a fancy way of saying the plant that lives on the coral skeleton, the animal that uh, makes up the coral, when that uh, gets ejected from uh, the organism. Coral bleaching is something that's probably been going on as long as there's been corals, and there's been corals on the planet for a very long time. Um, records of, of you know corals, uh, more than a couple hundred million years of coral history on the planet. But it seems to be something that's happening more frequently today. Um, this, some people, uh, some scientists feel that it's related to temperature. And it probably is a temperature component, but it's not just um, having high temperature because, you know, so for instance, places in Hawaii, uh, we have corals and sometimes we have coral bleaching events and the temperature doesn't get as hot 
as other places in the world like the Red Sea or Samoa or other places in the Western Pacific where the corals don't bleach. So what we, we think coral bleaching comes from rapid changes in conditions, that the particular animals that are adapted in one or another environment aren't used to those kinds of changes. Um, there's a lot of research going on today looking at different coral species that are more resilient to the kinds of events that cause bleaching. And people have thought about seeding coral reefs with some of these more resilient species, species that are sort of able to handle uh, the situation. When we have bleaching events, not every type of coral bleaches, only some of them do. So it, it's definitely a, a thing of concern, but probably not a thing to worry about for the future. Um, I suspect that in most environments where we find healthy coral ecosystems, some of the species that are present will be able to um, sort of carry on on a hotter planet with um, slightly um, higher sea levels and, and not bleach. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody for making the time for coming out. And thank you again very much to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for making this happen. We're out of time now. Um, but one of the great things about having internet on the shift, like Ken mentioned earlier, is that we can continue to take your questions and continue to have a conversation. And you guys can continue to follow along with what the ship is doing and how the expedition's going. Our website is www.schmidtocean.org. And you can follow along specifically to this cruise by using the hashtag Sea Level Secrets on Twitter and Facebook. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, so you can watch videos, read more information about it, um, and see different photos of what's going on. The handle for all of those is at Schmidt Ocean. So I hope you guys can continue to watch and, uh, and see how these things are, are going on, how the studies are happening. And if you have any questions, you can contact us through our webpage, which again is www.schmidtocean.org. We have a section called Ask a Scientist. So if you think of questions afterwards or we didn't quite have enough time to get to you this time, please visit our website and we will get back to you as soon as possible. All right. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it.